So the title of our message is quite simple. It's the power of the gospel, the power of God in the gospel. What is the power of God in the gospel? How does God liken his power? Does God's view of power equal to our view of power? What do you say? God's understanding of power, does it equal our view of power? Yes or no? If you say yes and if you say no, you need to have a reason. Amen? Amen. So today we're talking about the power of God in the gospel. The power of God in the gospel. So begin reading from the Bible. We read Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we're going to read this. We'll start from 15 up to 17. If you're there, say amen. If you're there, say amen. amen. Romans chapter 1, and I'll be reading verse 15, verse 15 to 17. It says, So as much as, he, as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for he is the power, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles or the Greeks also. So Paul is saying he is ever ready to preach the what? To preach the what? You guys are not giving me feedback. Paul is saying that he is ever ready to preach the what? The gospel. And then he's saying that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Why is shame attached to the gospel of Christ? He goes on to say that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because in it is the power of God that is unto salvation. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. The greatest need of man is what? Salvation. The need of a substitute. The need of a surety. The need of a savior. And Paul is saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in it is the power of God that is unto salvation. So the question that I have for you is this. How does God liken his power? Is it the same way that you and me liken power? Because when it comes to power, you and me think of what? Energy, strength. When it comes to power, we think of what? Spider-Man. We think of who? Saul, or Thor, or Zeus. Right? These are the gods that we think about when it comes to power. But when it comes to God's view of power, because what really matters in this world, young people, is God's view of things. Amen? How God views things is the end and the beginning of all things. The lenses that you should have when you're viewing yourself, you should view yourself the same way God views you. The way God views the world, that's the only view that matters. Any other view, my view, your teacher's view, Einstein's view does not matter. Only God's view really matters. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. God has the final say on how he views things. So with you and me, what we're going to do tonight is that we're going to survey the wondrous cross. We're going to survey the word of God so that we see how God views power. When the book of Romans, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. How many people is this power unto? Everyone that believes, whether you are a Jew or you are a Gentile, you and me fall into the category of who? Gentiles. Are we together? So it is to everyone that believeth. So the question that I have for you is, believing, 
How possible? How many people are capable of believing? How many people are capable of being believers? Everyone. Are we together? Are we together? What does it take for one to be a believer? They need to hear the gospel. (laughs) Are we together? Let's read the Bible. It says, for there in it is the righteousness of God revealed, verse 17, revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. Shall live by faith. Let's, Let's go to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 14, we'll read verse 17. Numbers chapter 14, verse 17. Let's see how God views power. Numbers chapter 14, we're reading verse 17 to 20, if I'm not mistaken. Numbers chapter 14, if you're there, say amen. Amen. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Some of you are saying amen because you're looking at the screen. Not because you are there, because you don't have your Bibles. One day the screen will not be there. What will happen to you? Okay, so let's read the Bible. It says... Should I read from the screen or from the written word? From the written word. Okay, from the written word it is. It says, verse 17, And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according to thou that you have spoken, saying... So Moses, let me give you the scenario of what is happening here. The context. Moses, God is about to destroy the children of Israel because they have chosen other gods are we together he's about to destroy them and he says to moses moses out of you i will make a great nation for these people are a rebellious people they have rebelled against me so many times but out of you i will make a great nation is that a good proposal imagine god speaking to you he says out of you i am going to make a great nation and i'm going to destroy everybody else is that a good proposal Huh? Can you take it? Huh? It is just you. Out of everyone else, they have rebelled. But out of you, I am going to make a great nation. Is that a good proposal? Moses has got a shepherd's heart. What does he say? This is what he says. He says, now I beseech thee, let the power of my God be what? Let the what? Remember, we're looking at the power of God in the gospel. The people have disobeyed God. They need only one verdict to be destroyed. To be what? Destroyed. But Moses appealed to the power of God. He says, I beg you, God, let your power be great. Here's what Moses says. It continues, it says in the next verse, it says, saying, the Lord is what? The Lord is what? Long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children, unto the fade and the fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of these people, according to thy greatness of thy mercy, and that thou, and that thou hast forgiven these people from Egypt even up to now. That is the power of God. Moses appeals to the power of God. He says, let thy power be great according to what you have said. Instead of destroying a rebellious people, I appeal to your great power. And what is this great power? He says, the Lord is what? Long suffering. What does it mean to suffer long? What does it mean that the Lord is long suffering? I wish this was a Hebrew class. I would have shown you the characters that are in the word long-suffering. It says, pardon these people. Long-suffering, let me ask you this question. How long is God? Infinite. Eternal. That's how long God is. So Moses appeals to the character of God, which is long what? 
suffering. Does God suffer? Yes, he does. Calvary is a testimony of a God that suffers. Are you with me? Ellen White says in the book Education, she says, the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of what sin has been doing to the great heart of God from its very inception. From the time that sin was conceived in the mind of Lucifer young people, God's heart has been destroyed and displayed naked to the entire universe. That's what sin does to the heart of God. So how long does God suffer? You tell me, if God is long-suffering, then how long does God suffer? Eternal. Are you with me? That is the greatness of God. That is the power of God. That he is able to bear with us into eternity. Are we together on that one? I mean, it says, listen, it says, the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy. What kind of mercy? Great mercy. How great is God? How great is God? He is as great as his nature is. And his nature is that he's infinite. Are we together? That is the power of God. That is how God measures power. God measures his power through his great mercy, his long suffering. By the way, Jesus suffers every single day. Every single day. Every deviation from the standards that he has set by us human beings causes him to suffer. Are we together? Continuing, it says, it says, forgiving iniquity and transgression. When it says iniquity, do you know what iniquity is? <laughs> do you understand what iniquity is? Iniquity is the twisting and the bendings that we have as human beings. We have the twisting in our nature. We love those things that are damning to God. We drink sin like it's water. That's iniquity. What is more appealing? Sitting here listening to the gospel or out there and listening to that thing which is going on there. What is more appealing? To the human heart, that is more appealing. That is why this place is not packed. It is not because you are so nice and good that you sit before me today. It is because of the grace of God. Somebody say amen. amen. It is because of the grace of God. Human nature, we have a twisting. We have an iniquity from within us. We, we, we run towards sin. We're different from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's nature recoiled from sin. But you and me call you towards sin. That is our nature. That is iniquity. So it says God forgives iniquity. Somebody say amen. amen. And do you know what transgression is? Transgression is the deliberate sin that you do. Having known you're not supposed to do this. Having known that I am not supposed to do this. I go ahead and do it. And do it. That is transgression. But the Bible tells us that God forgives what? Transgression. Somebody say amen. God's grace. You know, there was a scenario in the Bible when Jesus healed a man that was a paralytic man. Jesus healed him. And then the, the, the Pharisees murmured at the act of him healing that man. And then he asked them a question. Which one is simple? To say, rise from your bed and walk or to forgive sin? What is the answer? What is the answer? To say to a man that is a paralytic, paralyzed because of his own sin, rise from your bed and walk, or your sins have been forgiven. Which one is simple? You think to forgive sin is simple? To forgive sin is simple? No! 
It is not simple. Let me tell you, young people, to forgive sin, do you know what sin is? It is the transgression of an eternal law. That's what sin is. It requires somebody infinite and eternal to die and appease the broken law. And that is simple. The death of a God is simple. Which one is simple? Rise from your bed and walk is simple. To forgive sin, to bridge the gap. Do you understand? Listen, do you want, if, if you really want to understand how deeply a sinner you are, is check the chain that has been lowered down to rescue you. How long is it? Do you know what the chain is? It is Jesus. He's infinite. It's an infinite chain. Listen, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is what? For the wages of sin is what? But the gift of life is what? Eternal life. So when it says, for the wages of sin is death, it means eternal death. Are you with me? That's what it means, eternal death. You and me are not supposed to be here today. Every other human being that existed after the fall of Adam is living by the grace of God. Somebody say amen. We are not supposed to be here. We are supposed to die eternally. It took somebody equal to the broken law because the law is eternal. It's a transcript of God's character. It took somebody equal to the law to come and die for you and me. Are we together? The law can only be satisfied with somebody equal to it. Not your blood and my blood. I've told you before that if God was to kill all of us, all of us in this world, those that have lived and those that are going to live and those that have died, kill us and get the blood and present it to the law, that will be treason. Treason because the blood of bulls and goats and beasts and human beings cannot appease an eternal law. Somebody say amen. It takes somebody equal to God to die. And there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is power in that one man's blood. Are we together? Are we together? So let's go back to our sermon. It says, we're still in the book of Numbers. Numbers says, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children and upon their third and the fourth generation. This is what people don't understand. Why does God visit our iniquity? Why does he need to visit our iniquity? Let me tell you why. You have to study this out on your own. But this is the conviction that I have from reading scripture and reading the spirit of prophecy. God has to do a deeper work in us. Are we together, young people? He has to do what kind of a work? What kind of a work? Some of you are not responding. What kind of work does God have to do in us? A deeper work. A much more deeper work in bringing, and he does that work through the Holy Spirit. Are we together? Are we together? The Holy Spirit is there to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of what? Of judgment. That's what the Bible says, right? So the Holy Spirit's work is to convict you and me of how sinful you are. How twisted you are from within. Are you we together? It's not only about what you have done, but how twisted. Listen, let me give you, let me give you a story. Martin Luther is walking with one of his students, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, the reformer. He's walking with one of his students, and then they meet a man who is a drunkard. And then one of his students says, that man is a wretch. How does he drink like that? And you know what Martin Luther said? Except for the grace of God, I am that man. Except for the grace of God, I am that wretch. 
He knew how sinful he was. Except for the grace of God, you are that homosexual. Except for the grace of God, you are that prostitute. You are Hitra in the making, except for the grace of God. It keeps you. So do do you need to look down on others? Huh? Do you need to look down on others? The conviction of who we are has to be deepened by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to convict you that you are really a sinner, even though you have not done those sins that are outside there. Are we together, young people? He has to do a deeper work, a far much more deeper work. And when he does that, here is the beauty. On the day of judgment, the devil, Satan, is called the Hasatan because he is the accuser of you and me. Are we together? He accuses you. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 12, he says he accuses you day and night, day and night before the Father. So, the Holy Spirit has to do a deeper work of bringing stuff outside of you, bring you face to face with the horrors of your soul. And once that is done on the judgment day, because it was done before the judgment day, when the devil is accusing you, he will be accusing your substitute who is Jesus Christ. Are you with me? He will be accusing your substitute who is Jesus Christ because when those things burn about you are brought to life by the Holy Spirit right now and you begin to confess, you begin to repent and all that, you have a substitute. Are we together? And that substitute takes your place and his name is Jesus. He's got a spotless record, unblemished, separate from sinners, never sinned. And that is your record before God. So on the judgment day, when Ben's name comes up, and the devil says, oh, Ben did this, he did that, he did that, he did that. You know what the Holy Spirit is going to say? Oh, you have actually forgotten. He also did this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and you've been in agreement with the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Are you with me? You've forgotten. There's also this, and that, and that. It's a deeper week. Are we together? I mean, from there, he's going to say, because Ben knows about these things that are revealed to him, he confessed, he, he repented of them, and there was a substitute found for him. So who are you accusing? Are you accusing Ben or are you accusing the substitute? That's the gameplay, young people. So when I'm convicting you of your sins, When Jesus Christ, when you hear the word that I'm speaking and the Holy Spirit is talking to you about your sins, you need to agree with the Holy Spirit. Are we with me? Are you with me? By the way, Ellen White says, holiness is agreement with God. Huh? Holiness is what? You need to agree with God. I need to be in total agreement when God convicts me of me. And he tells me this is, and I need to love the work of the Holy Spirit. His plumbing work. Listen, the work that the Holy Spirit does is not a very nice work. Are you with me? It's like a plumber that comes to you and starts removing the sewer lines and touching all that. Nobody wants to be near the plumber, right? It's a filthy work. He has to do the filthy work in your life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And you need to be in agreement with him. To bring everything outside of you and say, listen, this is who I am. Yes, yes. And agreeing with God about who you are brings about holiness. Because there will be a substitute given unto you. The minute you're arrogant and say, you know what, I'm not those things. I'm not those things. You will start fighting the Holy Spirit. You end up committing what is called the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin. You end up grieving the Holy Spirit. Are we together? So God has to visit your iniquities. He has to visit our iniquity, my iniquities, the twistings of me. He has to. And you have to be in agreement with him. Are we together? Are we together, young people? Amen. I know you're looking sad, but this is good news. <laughs> huh? This is good news. 
Are we together? This is what the gospel means. Let's go ahead. Let's read the, the verses. It says, Pardoning also, I beseech thee, the iniquity of his people, and according to thy greatness of thy mercy. We've already read this. It says, forgive these people. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to read verse, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. If you're there, say amen. If you're there, say amen. You guys are very quiet right now. I don't know why. Verse 8. The Bible says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So the gospel in this verse has been associated with what? The power of God, but what else? The afflictions of the what? The gospel. There is an affliction that comes with the gospel. Are we together? It says, be ye not ashamed. How many are ashamed of Jesus? How many are ashamed of Jesus? There's a shame attached to this world's view. The way the world views the gospel, there's a shame attached. And sometimes we don't want to be associated with Jesus. We want to be associated with wear shirts written Spider-Man and all this. If we wear Jesus, it's in a hypocritical way. It's not actually true. We wear everything else. We want to be associated with the great people around. And we don't want to be associated with the only one who is great. And that is Jesus. It says, be not ashamed. Afflictions are attached to the gospel. Are we together? Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read verse 18 to 25. This is where I'm going to go crazy on you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. The Bible begins to explain to us something that I want you to understand. If you're there, say amen. Amen? Okay, so let's read the Bible, verse 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is what? It is what? Do you hear that? The preaching of the gospel is to them that are lost, it is what? Foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is what? The power of God. He continues, he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has God not made the foolishness of the wisdom of this world? Foolish, the wisdom of this world. So God has done something with the wisdom that comes with this world. The philosophy that comes with this world. God has turned everything else to be foolish. Are we together? Are we together? It continues, it says, listen, for after that in the wisdom, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom know, knew not God. It pleased God, but by the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. It is foolish for me to stand in front of you and preach. But it pleased God that via through what I'm doing today, to save them that believe and hear the testimony of what I'm giving you. It pleased them. But it says, by wisdom, the world did not know who? God. Through the vain philosophy of this world, the world has not known God. So the world, <laughs> the world will teach you a lot of things, but it will never, science bows to the great I am. A science that is separate from God is not science at all. There is only one science, and that is the science of the cross. Somebody say amen. 
the science of redemption, the science of salvation, how a God from heaven can come and dwell in a human body. Can you understand that? Can your science explain that? Which man has ever explained the mystery of salvation? How Jesus can be 100% human and 100% God at the same time. Tell me which science will explain that. Which physics will explain that. Which biology can explain that. How a virgin young lady can have, give birth to the Holy One of Heaven. Tell me which biology can explain that. Science bows to the great I am. Bows to the great I am. It says, listen, the Bible continues, it says, it says, for the Jews require a sign. Yeah? You want to see a sign? You want to see, to feel the power, to feel something inside you, they require a sign. And then it says, the, the Greeks seek after wisdom. So they write all this book, the educational system of the world is a Greek educational system. Trying to teach you this and that. Trying to bring you knowledge and this. But to no avail if that is not attached with God. It says, but we preach who? <laughs> Verse 23, it says, but we preach who? Do you hear me? It says, but we preach Christ unto the Jews he is a stumbling block do you know that Jesus Christ even in the church of God is still a stumbling block men will preach a lot of things but they will never preach Jesus you will hear a lot of sermons from here that will only add Jesus as an addendum at the end It says, but we preach Christ, him crucified. To the Jews, who are the chosen people of God, he was a stumbling block. How can a God be that poor? How can a God be born in a town which has got no reputation? How can a Messiah dress like that? A Messiah needs to come with all the host of the angels. To the Jews, he was a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. How does God die on the cross? But for God, that is the power of God that is unto salvation. And then it says, it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God his way of doing things, sending a savior to come and die for us, appears to be foolishness to others, but it is wiser than men. <laughs> Are we together? Are we together? It says, the weakness of God. <laughs> this, is, this verse is pregnant. It says, the weakness of God is stronger than men. So you see, you read the Old Testament, you see a God that is strong, that is able to part the seas and all this. And then you read the New Testament, God comes, he is born as a what? A little baby in the mind, seemingly powerless. He's born as a little baby in the manger. And then he's born in a manger. <laughs> and no reputation of place. With animals, thinking place. He's born there. But while he is born in a manger, angels come down from heaven and they're looking to see if the chosen people of God are acquainted with how the Savior would come. And when they look around, they don't see anyone else who's interested. And in their disappointment, as they are going and contemplating, they see only a small group of people talking about the Messiah. And those are shepherds, men of no reputation. And then they turn to the shepherds and they begin to speak to them and they say, Hey, be you not afraid. For today unto you, we bring unto you great joy. A savior is born in Bethlehem today. And when Jesus is born as a baby in a manger, angels from heaven bow down to worship him. 
They worship a baby in a manger. He is God infinite. The world is consisted in him. The whole entire human existence is predicated on this one man who is a baby in a manger. Mary would have dropped Jesus and Jesus would have died. What would have happened? Ellen White says, listen, in her book, Desire of Ages, she says, at the risk of an eternal loss, Jesus came. At the risk of an eternal loss, he came. This is the testimony of Jesus. He is seemingly, he is called Michael when he's going for war. And do you know what Michael means? Who is like unto God? It's actually a question. Who is like unto God? He comes down to fight the devil and destroy his power as a baby in a manger. Who fights like that? Who is like unto God? Who fights like that? He comes down, he leaves the whole army of the angels and he comes down as a baby, unprotected, born to a virgin baby, a virgin teenager. Who is like unto God? His whole life he lives out. He never has a home. He lives in people's homes. He is fighting. That is the power of God that is unto salvation. One man, he says, I have pressed. I have come to fight alone. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he is, he is surrounded by the whole host of demonic forces, including the devil himself. Every demonic force that you know surrounds Jesus. And the angels in heaven are about to come down and fight for their king. But God says, no, he must fight alone. Who is like unto God? He fights, he bleeds. On the cross, he is crucified naked. Everyone else is disappointed with him. By the way, the Roman never, the Romans never crucified anyone with clothes. Read your history. He fights alone. He wins the battles as a crucified savior, naked on the cross. And the devil sees that Calvary, young people, Calvary, Christ and him crucified, was the death nail in the devil's coffin. It was the last nail, nailing him to the ground. And Jesus is triumphant through death. Seemingly weakness, right? Seemingly foolishness, right? But that is the good news. Somebody say amen. How much time do I have? Well, I'm about to finish. We only have five minutes. So let's do this. Let's end it like this. I want to read to you in Isaiah chapter... Let's go to the book of Isaiah. I've skipped a lot of verses, but let's go to the book of Isaiah. I want you to see something, Isaiah 53. I want you to read a report that God gives us in Isaiah 53. If you are there, say amen. Are you there? Pay attention. It says, who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of God revealed? When it says the arm of God, it's the strength of God. Are we together? The power of God. Are we together? The arm represents work, strength of God. It says, to whom is the arm of God revealed, the Lord revealed? Who is going to believe this report? I'm about to read to you the report that God gives us. It's up to you to choose whether you believe it or not. Are we together? But if you believe it, there is joy. If you don't, there is domination. Let's read. It says, For he, he shall grow up before he shall grow up before him as a tender shoot, as a tender flower, as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness that when we, you and me, shall see him. There is no beauty that we, you and me, shall desire him. 
So seemingly when Jesus Christ comes on the scene of the world, there is no beauty that when we look at him, we gravitate towards him. There is no calmness that you and me, when we see him, we go towards him. The report continues, it says, he is despised and rejected of men, men, women, and children. Jesus is despised. We do not even desire him. Why? He is the desire of every being that exists, but we don't desire him. Listen, he continues, he says, surely, he, he says, sorry, it says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, uh, with grief and we heed as it were our faces from him. He is despised and we esteemed him not. How many esteem Jesus? We live in a generation where there is so much talk of self-esteem. Never Jesus' esteem. It's all about my self-esteem. My this and this. We esteem him not. It continues, it says, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet, having carried human sorrow, your sorrow and my sorrow my your grief and my sorrow. yet we this is our mindset it says yet we did not esteem we esteemed him stricken and smitten and afflicted of god but he was wounded for our transgression he was bruised for our iniquity the punishment of our peace was upon him and by his stripe you and me are healed he says all oh, we we you and me Every one of us have gone astray, everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the report. You and me love other things, we don't love Jesus. Then it continues, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet... He opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb before the, before the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shares. Yet he is dumb, and he opened not his mouth. He was taken from the prison and from judgment. Men handling God. Can you imagine? Human beings judging God. Yet he opened not his mouth. Seemingly weak, right? He's so weak, right? So gullible, right? Like we can just push him up. We can, we can spit on Jesus anytime we want. Right? Right? He is the doormat, right? We can do this to him, right? This is the report of the human nature. Every other human being, your mother, your father, your pastor, your preacher, everyone that you know, this is your report. This is my report. But God says... There's a time coming when he shall see all this because he has given his soul as an offering for salvation. God will look back and say, when, do you know the joy of God in heaven? It's to see you in heaven. It's to see that the work of Jesus Christ on the cross did not go in vain. It's to see every one of us who is seated in here, including those that are outside in heaven, seeing that the price that was paid was not in vain. That the infinite blood was not wasted. <laughs> is God going to say about you, young man and young lady, that what a waste. What a waste. What an investment. But what a waste. Having invested, do you know what it says in the spirit of prophecy? It says that heaven has been emptied for you and me. God left bankrupt for you and me. Make sure, make sure, make sure that you believe the report, that you become a believer of the gospel. Do not be swayed by vain philosophy and the traditions of men. Stick to the word of God. Amen? 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 Speak to the word of God. This is your salvation. This is the good news. We have a substitute. Amen? What do you say? What do you say?